All right, time for another edition of the Industry 45 Podcast Show. I'm your host, Shane Christopher Neal. Uh, you can always check out GiantTV.ca, Industry 45 Show, also GiantFM.com, Country89.com, and Giant TV Niagara to get the Industry 45 Podcast Show. And now it's also available at MusicLifeMagazine.net. Super pumped today for this podcast show, not only because I've always been a big fan of the Black Crows, especially in the earlier days, but also big fan of Steve Gorman's drumming. Steve was one of the original founding members of the Black Crows, along with the Robinson Brothers. Uh, he's written a book called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows, a memoir. And truth be known, when I found out I had this interview, I ordered the book from Amazon, and I figured I would skip through maybe every second or third chapter and read it to get kind of a gist of what the book was about so I could talk intelligently to Steve today. And I read 28 chapters in three days. I didn't skip a word, a chapter, nothing. I've not finished the book yet, but what a great read and so many great stories, so many sad stories, so many stories you just, I guess you just would not believe you. You need to pick up this book if you're a fan of the Black Crows and you want to know the inside scoop of what happened. Steve was in the band from uh, the late 80s up until about 2014, 2015. Uh, he's not in the band anymore. He does have a band called Trigger Hippie, which we'll talk about as well. But the Black Crows, Shake Your Money Maker, one of the most influential albums of all time, sold over 5 million copies. And its first, first million sold in about 11 months. Second million sold a month after that. And third million a month after that. The album peaked at number four on Billboard, had two number one hits, Hard to Handle, and She Talks to Angels. And Steve Gorman always says the Black Crows is what he does. It's not who he is. Let's find out who he is. Steve Gorman, up next, the Industry 45 Podcast Show. You're listening to the Industry 45 Podcast Show with Shane Christopher Neal on Giant TV. As I mentioned off the top, super pumped to do this because uh, not only did I spend my younger days as a, as a fan of the Black Crows, but being a drummer, who doesn't love another drummer? Welcome to the program, uh, Mr. Steve Gorman. How you doing today? I'm all right, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for answering the phone. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. And I got to tell you that it was on my radar to touch base with you months ago about this. Uh, kind of went off my radar, talked to Eric Alper. He said, hey, do you want to do this interview? I said, perfect. I got to get the goddamn book now. So I went and I ordered it on Amazon not that long ago. And I said, I'm going to read every third chapter. I just want to get a general idea of what this, this book is about. I started at chapter one. I read 28 straight chapters in two and a half days. I'm not done the book yet. Incredible book. Congratulations on that first. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a definite binge read from what I'm hearing from most people. So you probably get asked this as the first question often, but when did you decide to write this memoir and, and listen i didn't ever do a lot of drugs or drink a lot okay well drinking will be, that's debatable but i can't remember two weeks ago and you have such great description of you know 1990 1991 very much detailed in that i, I just how did you ever pull that off uh that's not by design trust me i, the, I have a memory that is uh it's a blessing and a curse um i just i i've always had a very linear uh, memory. It's funny because since I've written the book and since I've talked about it so much, I've I've been led to several things, uh, articles about memory, and without overplaying the hyperbole and trying to dramatize things, uh, an awful lot of of people with very strong memories used. Uh, it, it's the development of trauma of some sort, not not all time great trauma, but just in your own life. When I was ten years old, my family moved from Maryland to Kentucky. And it really was the beginning of me kind of remembering everything. I, I can go back and my memory before I was 10 is not that great. And from 10 on, it's all there. Pretty, pretty hardcore. And I was just heartbroken when we moved. And I was kind of not, um, you know, I, I, two things happened. I started doing some OCD stuff, trying to control my environment a little bit. And then I also just stayed a little detached from a lot of things. And it all went into a file. And and by the time I was, you know, 21 and moved to Georgia and started a band, I was having the time of my life. But those habits were there. The way I processed information was well established. So all this to say, 
it all kind of went into a hard drive that, that I'd be happy if I could delete some of it by now. Sure, sure. And, and you see that when you read the book. There's a lot of a lot of funny moments, great moments, a lot of really sad moments. Um, let me ask you this. You have a chapter early on that says, don't join this band, they're fucking crazy, which I thought was great. When did you realize the Robinson Brothers were going to be a handful to deal with? Well, I knew it the, literally the first two days. I met Chris the day I moved to Atlanta. I met his brother the, the next day. And I was immediately struck by how different they were from each other on the surface. And then just how I couldn't imagine them being in a band together. And, and then over the, within, within a week, I thought they're both pretty crazy. Um, however, there was also an undeniable chemistry between the three of us, to me anyway, when we played music and even just in hanging out. And it seemed like that was pretty significant. And when you're in a local band, yeah, it might be a little crazy. They might have a fight. They might, one of them might make sense. The other might make sense. A lot of times I didn't think either one of them did, <laughs> but then we wouldn't see each other for five days, you know, and it blows over. Um, I never had a full grasp of just what this was going to turn into until we hit the road nonstop for months on end, because then there's never a simmering down period. And in fact, it just ramps up and ramps up. And so the, the, the true culture of the black crows was established during the shake your Money Maker tour. We went out for 20 months. And by the time we returned from that first album cycle, we were cooked. I mean, we were just in a hamster wheel and we were never, ever, really ever able to break out of it in so many ways. So the tours that you were on, so you were talking about the Aerosmith tour in the book uh, that was, it seemed to be a disappointment for you guys. Robert Plant and ZZ yeah. Top, you guys get fired from that tour because of Chris going off about sponsor free rock and roll. Um, you know, Back then, like or now, do you look at that with regret, thinking, you know, these are some pretty epic big bands, and here we were just being a bunch of, I don't know, a bunch of idiots, and look what I... No, I, no. Well, no, I mean, it makes sense, to, you know, and I wrote those chapters. I mean, I did my best to write from the perspective at the time. You know, it's not so much, there's definitely some 30 years later, this is clear to see, but but I really wanted to get the feeling across of what it felt like in the time. And, you know, we were disappointed opening for Aerosmith and it's, I mean, that's just cause we had, we just weren't, we didn't want to be grown ups, and we didn't want to face reality to us. We were still like living this dream for the first time. And they were very buttoned down and very, you know, they were building their career back up after having lost everything. They were sober and serious and they didn't give two shits what we thought about the world. And we thought we were going to get out on tour with them and I'll be best friends. I mean, we were just, it was our naivete, but, but, you know, you can't have that naivete without a crazy amount of ambition and blind faith in each other and in what we're going to do. And, you know, it's all connected, you know, like it's real easy to say we were not realistic, but had we been realistic, we wouldn't have ever gotten a record deal in the first place. Sure. Makes good sense. You talk a lot about the, the, uh, infighting in the band and drugs and alcohol, but you know, there's moments in this, as I read it, like in Edinburgh here, where you're talking about someone in the crowd throwing things at Chris. And it seemed like you all had each other's back at some point, you were all in it together. And there was a fight that broke out and you were jumping over the drums. And there's, I think an incident yeah. in, in Denver, was it? And so th it just seemed like you guys were like a gang, a team at one point early well, on. We used to say it. Yeah, we definitely, well, I certainly saw it that way. I, I mean, I, that's exactly how I saw it. Very much a team. And I, I grew up playing soccer and basketball my whole life. And I was in a situation in both sports where I had great coaching and opportunities where just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, you sacrifice for the better of the team. And so that's just the mentality I was, and I'm the eighth kid in a family. So I was raised with that from the jump. Um, I joined a band of, you know, Chris and Rich just had each other as siblings. Johnny and Jeff didn't have siblings or Jeff had a sister, but not a brother. No. And, and the brothers Robinson were both, they both acted like they were only children. Anyway, it was a weird, I was definitely all team. Let's go one for all, all for one. And it, and the, the truth is I, no one else really understood that level of thinking or no one shared that, that, that level of thinking. And it took me forever to figure that out. I thought that was the most basic thing in the world. You know, mm -hmm. it's like when you're 21 years old, you don't have a talk about values. You have a talk about you want to play in a band and then you just do it. And then, you know, by the time we're all in our mid thirties, it's like, oh yeah, values and, and true motivation. Those things are kind of important if we're going to keep this together. And we were, it's funny to look back now, but on so many levels, we were never on the same page. We all shared an intent 
and we all shared a burning desire, but even what we were trying to get was different looking back, you know, it was, but along the way we made great music. I mean, I don't spend a ton of time in the book talking about how wonderful our music is. That speaks for itself. People either dig it or they don't. Right. But really to me, it's a story about people and it's about relationships. It, it's funny when you say dig it or you don't. So the, I don't even know what year it is, but it's definitely during shake your money maker. I'm in Hamilton, Ontario at a show. And I don't know if it's Billy Joel or Hart. I don't know why those two names come to mind, but but the Black Crows opened Heart. up a show. Was it Hart? Okay. It was Hart. Okay. Yep. So I remember sitting on the second level, looking down almost side stage, never heard of the Black Crows. I'm an 80s rock guy, okay? I listen to fucking hair metal. The Black Crows come on. Uh, they're okay. They, they, they play hard to handle. You guys play She Talks to Angels. Blew my mind. Went out and bought the record. There was something about the band and the music that even for someone like me, who really was not something I'd typically listen to, I bought into. Yeah. And and then I bought the Southern Harmony and Musical Companion album and another great album. Uh, I want to ask you musically just right now about those two albums. Do you think that Shake Your Moneymaker is the best album the Black Crows had ever made, number one? And where does Southern mm -hmm. Harmony compare? Because it debuted at number one when it came out. No, I, I don't think Shake Your Money Maker is the best album we ever made. It's certainly the most important album we ever made for a billion reasons, both both uh, practical and ethereal. But the best album we ever made is the Southern Harmony. The, our second album is the most solid top to bottom, and it represented a, a degree of growth that the band could never have again. From, from the summer of 89 to the fall of 91, when those two albums were recorded, we became a hundred times the band we were that made Shake Your Money Maker. And so, you know, for a lot of those reasons, Southern Harmony was just, Shake Your Money Maker was the album we made when we were dreaming of being the kind of band that would make a record like Shake Your Money Maker. We pulled an album out of the hat that was way better than we were as an actual functioning band. By the time we made Southern Harmony, we had become the band we always wanted to be. And so, and I also think that the song, I think that's the most authentic. Shake Your Money Maker wears its influences very loudly on its sleeves. And I don't apologize for that, never have. Southern Harmony is a band that's pretty much found itself and is doing something that at that time no one else could possibly do. We were, we were in our own lane in the world of rock music, really from 91 through 1997. And, and I think that all the records we made during that time were really good. And that's not to disparage Shake Your Moneymaker at all. It's just a classic example of a first album being you throw the kitchen sink at it and work so hard because you're just not good enough to make a, a record without a million screws being turned. Right. And then Southern Harmony, we were able to just plug in and let it rip and it just exploded and it just spoke for itself. We, we had become that band. And, I think and before I forget. Yeah, go ahead. Before I forget, that night you referenced in Hamilton, I wrote this, I wrote 900 pages, and the final book is 350. But I wrote the story of that gig and some stuff from the Heart Tour that was ultimately we took out. After that gig, you saw us. As we were leaving town on the bus that night, some kids, that, like a 7-Eleven or like a convenience store, we saw them in the parking lot. They threw eggs at our bus. <laughs> Well, that's just Hamilton. They, do that, they driver, do that regularly there. Yeah. And our bus driver was like, you know, some of the bitches, and he saw them do it. And we are the kind of guys back then. This is not our what? bus. It's a bus that we're leasing. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. And we were all, let's go get them. And we truly, we turned that bus down a tiny residential street and all hopped off the bus. And we chased these 12 and 13 year old kids <laughs> through a bunch of yards. That's a true story. Our bus driver and me, Chris, and Johnny Colt were chasing after kids to catch them so we could kick their ass <laughs> for egging our bus. And the police were called, uh, and they pulled us over. I mean, we, they came up to the bus on this tiny little street, and our bus driver ran on the bus. He changed his shirt and put on a hat. So if anybody had ID'd him, he'd look different. <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> That's crazy. And yeah, I was at that's I think the only time I ever saw the Black Crows, but man, uh it stood yeah. out in my memory and obviously it stands out in your memory too for that reason. Oh yeah, well yeah, that was the one time we ever, you know, thought let's go chase a bunch of, you know, teenagers <laughs> for throwing eggs at the bus. Those things do tend to stick out. Uh in the book, obviously again a lot of of high highs and lows and there was a real low uh in Japan there where, you know, it's hard to believe you're on top of the world. Um 
you're playing all over the world, top albums, top band, and here you are thinking about jumping out of a window because you can't take what's going on anymore. Like real briefly, can yeah. you speak to that? Because that to me would have been something really tough to write and to recall. Well, it, it, it wasn't tough to write or recall because I have processed it and dealt with it. And it's I've talked about it for years. It's not like a repressed memory that I was, you know, surprised to uncover. So, I mean, that's the good part. Um, you know, it's a very common story now um, about people. You know, it's it, it's not necessarily a great thing to get everything you ever wanted, because one of the side effects of that is you're left with all the time in the world to figure out who you really are and you notice how much stuff you have missed along the way. And then you're like, Oh, all that stuff I was ignoring in my central nervous system or my subconscious, because I was just focused on getting here. Well, you arrive at some place after a really, you know, single minded pursuit with incredible effort over years can sometimes leave you feeling incredibly empty because you missed a lot along the way. And that's, that's what hit me. And then on top of that, just the band's dysfunction. Like I said before, I was go team. And it started to dawn on me really, really heavily that everybody was in it for themselves or everybody was in it for something that I didn't understand or relate to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I got to leave my own band. And at the same time, I thought, well, I don't know who I am outside of this band. And it was just a very, it was a brutal time for me. And I didn't have the sense God gave a mule to simply tell anybody, hey, I think I'm losing my mind. Because that's not what you think to say when you're 27 and you feel like you should be on top of the world. Sure. Absolutely. And I think now I think people today, I think that's a conversation people have all the time today. I mean, there's just more an awareness. There's certainly more places you can go. If a musician is feeling like that on the road right now, if they think to, they can Google depression or anxiety or, you know, any number of things that may give them a little insight that didn't exist in 1992. I was just in yeah, Japan you, you're drinking myself to, yeah, I'm just drinking as much beer as I can get down a day thinking and blaming myself going, what is wrong with you, man? What is wrong? Get over it. You know, and that's not, that's not going to help anybody. Do you have a, a favorite story or chapter in the book? Well, the Jimmy Page stuff is the most fun. It was the most pressure free and the most stress, not pressure free. It was the most stress free, the band of, of the band's existence, I think, because, you know, we were really good at tearing into into each other we were very good at sabotaging ourselves personally and career-wise the the comp the, the work we did with jimmy page came out of nowhere we didn't see it coming it was completely organic and natural and it was just did it because it was fun and then it got even more fun and then people loved it and we you know, it didn't even occur to me to ever say, God, wouldn't it be awesome to play Led Zeppelin songs with Jimmy Page? Like, that wasn't a dream or a goal I had ever had. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we're doing it. And so, for a lot of reasons, in the context of where the band was in 1999 when that happened, we were basically, we had run through the deck and we were out of cards. And all of a sudden, we're on tour with Jimmy Page and the whole world loves us again. And it really opened up a million doors that had been slammed in our faces, all of which slammed in our faces because of decisions we made you know we were an incredibly self-sabotaging band despite the great efforts of a tremendous manager uh the whole time so you know it was that that part of the book too is a big lift because it was a pretty steady downhill run with the band's prospects and with me and my perception of things and and the way i'm talking about how i viewed the world and so for that to pull itself out of the ditch for a brief period of time for about a year was really pretty pretty incredible I uh, want to ask, oh, thank God, by the way, the band is not called Cobb County Crows because that would have been horrible. Uh, so you well, yeah. <laughs> you leave the band in what, 2014, 2015, somewhere around there? Uh, well, the band just ended in, tw in 2014. It, it just ended. Okay. There, I, I didn't, I never said I quit. What Rich and I said was we reject Chris's new terms and he had said he won't work with the band anymore unless we accepted them. So and that was it crazy. Was that was legally, like that was like seventy five percent of the income he was looking for, or something like that. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It was an insane. It was a power grab after twenty seven years that that just. Def, I mean, I, I mean, in a, in a career full of absurd comments and decisions, that one really took the cake. Wow. Uh, what else do I want to ask you here? What about um, uh, any? What do you want people to take away from the book? So when people are done reading this, is it just? Like, is there anything that you think about that somebody should take away? And I hope they get this message 
from reading uh, Hard to Handle? Well, I can tell you this, that when I look back on, you know, it's 27 years of my life that I'm incredibly grateful for. I'm very proud of what we did musically, despite incredible odds, because all of the problems in the band were internal. There was, you know, to li- to survive that long in a constantly shifting landscape is impossible for a lot of bands because a lot of bands blow in the winds of current trends. We never did that. We, we established the fact that we didn't need to be trendy and then we still blew it because we tore each other apart. And so as much as I'm appreciative of the, the ride and the opportunity and for the things that were great, were really great. I had a lot of those man on the moon moments, you know, like, Oh my God, like we're actually doing this right now. But at the same time, it's never not going to be sad because it's 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 a tremendous example of how to blow a career, how to throw away opportunity after opportunity. And and I don't even mean that in commercial sense, like money and tickets and album sales. I just mean, again, the idea that you could start something with your friends and go out together. You know, it is like a team, like let's go win the tournament. And then every time you get to the semifinals, somebody just doesn't tie their shoes and they throw the ball out of bounds. It was just nonstop insanity and uh, true insanity and mental illness and addiction most specifically, and then codependency and betrayal and loyalty. It's all of those things, but it's a very human experience about people. Like I said, so I I'm filled with gratitude. I have a lot of sadness, but you know, it's all okay. I mean, I'm great. You know, it's been six years since the black crows factored into my thinking and planning since I knew I knew six years ago this month, okay, I'm never going to be in a room with that guy again. And it's been great. My, the last six years have been the happiest I've ever been in my life. You know, I was ready for the black crows to be done. I Mm -hmm. thought it was important that we finish it on a high note together just to rewrite the, just because the last chapter could really save a bad story. And that's what I wanted from a final tour and it didn't happen. So that's okay. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it would have been a mind boggling if we had pulled off the tour we had planned for 2015. So I'm totally cool with where it all sits. And I have a, you know, I have a family, I have a band called trigger hippie that I love. I, have yeah, I was going to ask, show. I was going to ask you about that wrote, in, in a sec. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm very busy. Trigger hippie is something I've been doing off and on for 10 years. And for the last few, we fired it up again, made an album and it came out in October and we're, we're not, we haven't booked any Canadian dates ever, but, that's certainly something we'd love to do, but we're playing all throughout 2020 and we're just, you know, it, it's, I've got a million projects going on at all times. I'm very busy and I'm very thrilled to be where I am. So, you know, the book brings out a lot of different things from people. If someone's a diehard black crows fan, it can be really tough to read at some parts. Sure. Uh, but you know, I couldn't, I couldn't be concerned with that. It's a very honest story of my life in a band with some people. I mean, that's kind of how I see it. So, the people who are less connected to the band going in, I think they get the thematic. I think they see the narrative and they get the overarching themes a lot more clearly the first time through than a diehard fan who's having their chain jerked by, Oh, I can't believe they did this to each other. I can't believe he said that to him or whatever it is. A fan would be upset by. Not that this matters. Uh, but did you think that Chris or Rich have read the book? I don't think they, I'm, I'm sure they've had parts of it read to them. I mean, I'm sure they're aware of what a lot of it says, but there's no way in my mind, either one of them will actually sit down and, and read the book. They would not want their, it's much easier to dismiss something when you don't know what it says. And that's where their mindset is right now. And, and my last question, I mean, and, 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 truth be, and truth be told, and I knew this before the book came out, their biggest problem with the book isn't what's in it, but the fact that it exists in the first place. That's good because point. in their yeah. mind and this, this, you know, in their mind, they were the black crows and that's, that, that speaks to why the band struggled so mightily. They never understood that, you know, our success was the result of many, many people's grand efforts and ambition and that they played a very small part in the literal development of a plan as far, you know, how did everyone hear about the black crows? It wasn't because they wrote good songs. It's because they wrote good songs and about 12 other things all happening together at the same time with a great plan and with somebody orchestrating that plan. And then the entire band stepping up and delivering. And, you know, that's just that's an unfortunate reality of of their worldview. But they're the ones who have to live with that. No one else does. Have you seen any, uh, I don't know, YouTube video like they're on tour? Um, I saw the Howard Howard Stern uh, show. I didn't know. Did you watch any of it or? 
Well, I see, you know, it's not like people don't send me stuff constantly. Hey, did you see this? You know, like I wake (laughs) up and there's 11 text messages. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. So, yeah, I mean, I've looked at it. I haven't combed through it, but I'm not going to say I haven't watched any of it. I've seen a few minutes over the last few months of what they're doing, and it's exactly what I would expect. I mean, nothing surprising about any of it. Right. Uh, Okay, listen, I appreciate your time. Good luck with Trigger Hip. You still got a radio show, you said, right, that's still on the air? Yeah, Steve Gorman Rock. It's a classic rock show that started last September. That's uh, with Westwood One Nationwide. I mentioned at the beginning, before I got on the phone with you, that the Black Crows is what you do, but it's not who you are. And I'm glad we got to find out who you are. Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure, man. I appreciate your time.